Hello, hello, and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers. I'm your host, David the Skeptic, and I'm uh, joined by a few guests here. This is a supplemental, a supplemental episode. So we uh, have had a, a very interesting uh, little conversation uh, between a few of us, few of us uh, five questions uh, that we try to deal with uh, concerning sex, uh, dealing with sex and theology. Um, and uh, we had uh, Dale for parts of that. Dale, uh, uh, has a particular uh, theory about spiritual harm, and uh, there were some of us who really wanted to respond to that, but uh, for the sake of time, we wanted to keep the uh, podcast short. And so uh, this is a supplemental. Uh, I promised that we would get back to this, and uh, here we are. Uh, and so, Dale, spiritual harm. Here's here's um, Here's, here's just kind of my opening to this. I would think, in, and I want to also share uh, with something that Brian with an I said, spiritual harm, it's hard to see how there would be spiritual harm if there weren't also other types of harm that you could see. So for instance, psychological harm uh, or physical harm. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to think in terms of a spiritual harm or for that matter, a spiritual harm that wouldn't also manifest uh, in some non-spiritual way, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and let you uh, take that. And I think that Andrew had a, uh, a a question, so I'm gonna let you guys um, get started with that. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, I think you're right. Like when I talk about spiritual harm, it includes psychological harm, emotional harm, and even physical harm because. Uh, my version of substance dualism um, is a Thomistic one. So I think that the body is a mode of the soul itself and that sort of thing. So it's all connected on the Christian worldview. Um, and yeah, it, it takes different forms for different people, um, depending on the circumstances and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I forget what his question was. So, so yes, um, what would be something that would not necessarily manifest um, in one of these other fields, I, I don't, I think that it will always manifest in, in those things, even when we're talking about damaging our spirit, which is the faculty of our soul, which allows us to really relate to God. Well, again, that all of our faculties are interconnected. So that's, you know, the way I relate to God involves emotions. It involves, you know, mental psychology and cognitive faculties. Um, and even physical sensations are, are sometimes a part of worship of God. So um yeah i wouldn't say that it's totally separated they they are interconnected and affect all of our faculties are are involved with and affected by sexual union so uh, i'm i'm glad that you and i are going to get a chance to talk about this because i'm not sure that there's uh well there's going to be a lot of nuance and uh, it's hard to have this conversation with folks that, that can't carry a lot of nuance in a conversation. So I'm glad that we're going to get to talk about this. Um, so let me ask you first uh, about premarital sex. Does, in your view, because some Christians say yes and some say no, does premarital sex cause spiritual harm in, in your view? Yes. Okay. All right. I thought, I thought that was probably the case. So... It's earlier on the last show, you said that um, that people that got married experienced uh, a special kind of sex that people who are not married don't experience. I don't want to misquote you. So I thought it was words to that effect. Is that close enough? Um, it's, it's not necessarily about the It's the bond that's created. So I think it's uh, Chris, yeah. Christians. Yeah. Uh, experience a special kind of bond in, in marriage uh, mm. in and this is why we're now committed so even jews in the old testament didn't have this and this is why god could allow for divorce without causing the same degree of spiritual harm now, divorce always causes spiritual harm no matter what it's always a bad thing because it's not the way we're designed to be but i think that there's less standard I would say, whereas the Christians were bonded to a higher degree, and if you break that, it causes even more damage or something like that for true Christians. 
All right, I'm glad I'm glad you went back through that because I that does make my question slightly different. So um, this this special spiritual bond that married people might have. So for for sake of our discussion, let's just say they do have. It. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, accept the proposition for the sake of conversation, or or accept the conclusion for the sake of conversation that married people have a special spiritual bond that occurs, and it occurs. Uh, does it occur only because of sex, or can they have this bond without sex? Um, I, I think to the same degree it requires the sexual union. That's why God created it um, in the first place. There's, there's something special about that act, uh, but that's not okay. to say without. Oh, sorry. Uh, that, oh no, I was I'm just active listening. My apologies. Oh no worries. Um, but that's not. I'm not. Obviously, I'm not saying people can't bond um, without that. Like uh, you know, having sex outside of marriage creates a bond. That's provable. I mean, everyone who's had sex feels feels that and understands that and that sort of thing for the most part. So, and even without sex, you can have bond. Like I, I have a bond to you as a friend and stuff sure. like that. And that sure. involves again all right. sorts. We of are friends. So it seems to me that there are at least some edge conditions that might be a, a, a person having to make a kind of trade-off for one spiritual harm versus another. So I'll, I'll give the example and then tell me what you think. So two people that don't have sex before marriage, uh, if you're willing to acknowledge for the sake of this conversation that it's possible for two people to get married and may not enjoy sex with each other, who thought they might? So if, if you accept that it's possible that two people are sexually incompatible, um, what they would have to do is accept that they're never going to have um, this type of good sex. And so there's a, there's a sort of harm there. There's a, an expectation that they're supposed to get out of marriage, which is, which is good sex. Um, and so they're going to have to trade that can't leave marriage and just hope that the spiritual bond that is strengthened through the sex, which is not going to be strengthened, like I said, they're, they're not having good sex, but they're going to have to trade that, uh, this idea that they're spiritually bonded for the rest of their lives for sex that they're not enjoying. And I just wonder what you think about that. And doesn't, doesn't that mean that premarital sex actually is, in some sense, uh, a good idea? So the problem was I, you were kind of like going in and out and there was wind in the background. Oh, sorry. Outside. So yeah. like I, I didn't catch everything you were saying. So I, I heard that you were making this contrastive thing because I was saying that marriage, I, I assume you mean by christians specifically because that, that's yes that's exactly true. right two christians and and they're both virgins when they get married and uh but they as it turns out they just don't have good sex together right so they haven't done anything spiritually wrong they're not tainted in any in any sense that would have to do with their sexuality and uh and so they think they're going to have good sex and that's going to increase their spiritual bond but there are people who just don't have good sex inside their marriage and so these people are going to have to make a trade, this, this lesser spiritual bond and, and a lack of a good sexual relationship. And where that, where that can be the case, if you acknowledge that it can be, wouldn't that actually mean that premarital sex for everyone is, is a good idea, that they, that they get to find out whether they're compatible ahead of time with the person that they're going to marry? Yeah, so, so in the first place, I just speaking secularly, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Like, certainly as a non-Christian, I always say, what, what the heck? Yeah, it makes sense to try to just like moving in together, seeing how that works. Mm -hmm. Speaking as a Christian who has divine revelation informing me, I, I would not say that. And I guess I would sort of put it on, well, what do you mean? How are we defining good sex? What does that mean? Um, and I don't think the Christian would want to say that it's necessarily the same thing that what most people are thinking of is good say so like on a sort of physical level hey i've got the skills as as uh well i can't respond to that uh you know some 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 skeptics you know i've got these skills in terms of performance value 
it's marriage is not about that. That's why that's part of the reason why marriage is important, not even from a scriptural perspective, but there's this notion of commitment. This is why the ancient Near sure. Eastern cultures put the institution there in the first place. And it's about this, this bonding uh, and oneness of flesh. So to use biblical language and that sort of thing. So one could have good, one could, in terms of performance, suck like heck and be horrible. And let's pretend you'll always be bad. You, you can never develop the skills to, to please or whatever it is um, on one level. It'll always still be good good sex from the perspective of scripture you're having that bond you're in that committed relationship with that person that you love and want to spend the rest of your life with and that's let me I'm let me go ahead and jump in here i i just want to say that's exactly what i expected you to say by the way uh so but, i would have been surprised if you had said anything uh differently <laughs> so <laughs> before um, you can i ask you a question is that okay if I ask you? Uh, sure, because I uh, I want to I want to get in there and get uh, get a question or two in on spiritual harm. Um, and I've got one more question too. So wherever I mean I'm I'm not asking to be prioritized. I just have one okay. more question there. So Andrew, with, let me just ask this quickly, and I'll I'll let you sure. whoever you are, David, whoever wants to ask me after. But does that answer make sense? So let's pretend I. Uh, I guess I shouldn't personally, but you're married, right? So let, let's pretend you weren't good in bed, for, for lack of a better way to phrase it, performance-wise. Um, you Would you say, oh, well, yeah, my wife has the right to get me and stuff like that. Go for someone who actually knows what they're doing? Or do you think, no, there's more to your marriage than you would expect her to stand by you regardless of how your performance Fair enough. So, David, are you okay with me taking 45 seconds to answer? Uh, yeah, but the, the, but then we'll move on to the other part of the yeah. um, question. Just just the way um, Dale asked the question, Dale, you actually would rather ask that question to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, but, the, but the answer uh, is probably going to be the same. The answer is yes, uh, to, to put it simply. Okay, great. So okay. here's, here's, I think, the, the first problem. When, when we talk about sex, I think there's an equivocation on the word good in this conversation. So when I say good sex, I mean between two people, that both people are able to reach orgasm during their sexual relation. I don't care what their skills are. They can both suck at it. But I think that when we talk about sex, we always mean good in the context that either partner can reach orgasm and, and even sometimes together. And so if we satisfactory, if we, in, in other words, yeah. um, enjoyably satisfactory. Right. And, and so if you're if, so then if you say, OK, well, by good, I'm talking about sex and I don't mean orgasm. I'm uh, maybe you're not equivocating on the word good, but it's not good sex in the sense that I mean it. So we're not talking about the same thing in regard to my relationship with uh, with Allison. I will say this, and then David, I'm, I'm, you can have the floor completely back, and thank you for letting me answer. Where Allison and I are concerned, um, we don't think that relationships end uh, over sexual infidelity. We actually think that the problem uh, of sexual infidelity happens through root causes that are, that are prior to that. There's some need that's not getting met prior to sexual infidelity, and so for us, we do not take the position that um, that uh, someone stepping out, as it were, if you sort of take the 1970s term, you know, uh, that would not necessarily end our relationship and it wouldn't necessarily be all that controversial. What we would want to know from each other is why was there, what was this other need? And, and if it was something that was broken between us, is there a way to fix it? And if there's not a way to fix it, then we would both love each other enough to move on. And these are the relationship, the, these are the things that we talked about. Well, David can testify to this because he was around when Alice and I first started dating. These are the kinds of conversations that we talked about that I would pass on uh, in part because these are big issues, and I would not expect her uh, necessarily to never go out 
Uh, and, and if she did, it would be something that, that we would talk about as openly as we talk about everything else. So I hope that answers the question that you're asking about both good sex and my particular relationship. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And, and sorry, I didn't mean to get like personal. I just wanted to like oh, it's provide that example because it, it, it shows that, yeah, there, there's more to it than just, just, you know, having performance wise or something like that. There's much, much more to your relationship, to your marriage and that sort of thing. So, um, and that, you know, that's, uh, proven by the fact that you say, well, if, if that, that's just an effect, there's something else behind it as to why. It, so, so yeah, I think that both you and David kind of agree with me that there's more to it and we, we would kind of want or have this. No, idea. we wouldn't agree with you on, <clears throat> on your definition of good sex. Um, so it, as far as the role that sex plays in a relationship, we probably wouldn't agree with that either. But I would say that the thing that we would agree uh, on together, most likely is that neither Andrew nor I consider our sex lives all that uh, big of a deal as far as personal. I mean, that's what we're, she persons, said. we're persons and we have sex. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, we don't, we don't do it together, uh, possibly simultaneously, but not, not with each other. But the fact is, every, every body who's a fully uh, rounded human being, uh, most typically, unless there's some extraneous factors, has sex. They have, they have a sex life. And um, so my sex life is no more personal to me than, you know, my, my bowel movements. Uh, I'll, I'll happily talk about those too, if there's someone who wants to hear it. Um, but it's not some sacred function um, that, that I can't discuss at least generically and so I wanted to I wanted to come back with your notion of spiritual harm and your response to Brian with an eye uh, his uh, observation that spiritual harm should coincide uh, with some other mm -hmm. harm that we would be able to see and uh, because you have a Thomistic model I'm just going to say something a little surprising which is uh, I don't think that you and I would have a problem then uh, with with the harm model of sexuality, uh, because I, it doesn't matter to me if you think there's some spiritual harm underneath a physical harm or emotional harm. Uh, harm, if there's harm that I can detect, that, that a secularist can look at and say that's harm, and you would say, yes, but there's spiritual harm underneath it. I don't care if you think there's spiritual harm underneath it. We would both be against the harm to, to be done. So as, as long as your harm, your idea of harm tracks with my idea of harm, we're on the same page. The problem is uh, and by the way, I, I also want to add some nuance to what you're saying and maybe still man that a little bit. You're not just uh, uh, talking about spiritual harm. You're also talking about spiritual benefit, uh, like the bond. There's a physical bond, an emotional bond, but there's also a spiritual bond, uh, a spiritual aspect to that to that bond that, that you would say, too. So there's spiritual harm, but spiritual benefit. I don't care if you add spiritual to it. If, if there's some harm that we can agree on that's happening, then then I'm dead set against it too. The problem though, I think Dale, that, that you and I would have, and you and uh, almost all of the audience <laughs> would have, uh, at least the non-Christian audience, would be that we disagree uh, on the harm being there in the first place. So just as, in, just as a, for instance, uh, Andrew, brought up an example of a couple uh, wanting to test out the waters, as it were, sexually speaking, before they got into a committed relationship. Because quite frankly, it would be a, a terrible relationship if a young couple were tied together for the next 50, 60, 70 years for the rest of their long uh, and healthy life and simply hated sex. That would be a, a good reason not to marry. Um, and so uh, you think that there would be spiritual harm or some harm of some kind if that couple engaged in sex. 
I do not see any harm in that couple engaging in sex. And so you would have to describe that spiritual harm in terms that I could understand as some kind of harm. And my, my concern is that you're, you're gonna be using that spiritual harm terminology in ways that don't coincide with any other uh, kind of external harm. Well, so, so remember, yeah, I like the way you said it. It's, it's just, it's all about harm, period. Because the way I use spiritual, my understanding of substance abuse is all inclusive. If there's a physical harm, that's spirit. That's a spiritual harm. If there's a mental harm, or if there's emotional harm, that's all included in what I'm calling spiritual harm because it's all the same thing. So I, I like exactly. That. So, so I'm just asking you to point out where the harm is for um, people having sex before marriage. Is there a is there a kind of harm that is exclusively spiritual that has no mental, emotional, physical? psychological aspect is is there a kind of harm that is uh that is just spiritual and if so how do you detect it versus physical psychological emotional that 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 kind of thing because if there's not if there's no spiritual harm that is not paired with a physical harm or an emotional harm or a psychological harm that kind of thing as far as i can tell spiritual harm wouldn't mean anything Right, but I so I, I won't be able to answer that question, but I want him to answer the question that I asked very specifically first. I want okay, to address sure. I want to address the question because he's already said uh, uh, that he believes that all of all of the kinds of physical harms that we're talking about have a spiritual component to them. And so what I'm asking for is in that particular example, what is the harm? I would I can agree with you on the harm if you tell me what the harm is I should be looking for. Okay, so okay, so that's not what I thought you were asking. So that's interesting. Okay, so so I'll start with Andrew's thing. Um first, um his question. Wait, wait a minute. I I would oh, no. really <laughs> like an answer to my question. Well, there's a reason okay. why I'm getting to, I'm going to get to yours. There's a reason why I want to answer for yours second, but um so, so Andrew, yes, answering your thing, there are uh, everything is uh, emotions are a quote unquote spiritual faculty. Our emotional faculties are a faculty of our soul. Our cognitive faculties are a faculty of our soul. So it's, it's about when I'm saying spiritual harm, I'm, I'm saying any kind of harm that uh, impacts upon a faculty of our soul um, in some way that can be emotional, that can be physical, that can be cognitive, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, David's uh, David's question. Um, okay, so I thought you were asking me for what is the evidence that there is harm, but you're saying what is the the nature of harm uh, of this quote unquote spiritual harm? I would say it's it what it is is it's um, basically warping our our souls to and faculties to operate in ways that they weren't designed to operate. And this has negative impacts on us, again, various capacities in different capacities, depending on the, the context. It could be physical, it could be psychological or emotional and that sort of thing. So it's- Okay, so um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be too uh, abrupt, but it's, um, I've, I've, given, I've given you a, um, a long time to spool that out. And I really need a more direct answer to the question that I asked. Um, so a, a person has sex before they get married. Tell me what the harm is you see that's happening so that I can see it too. So you want an example or something like that? I've, I've given you an example. I just want you to tell me what the harm is. Because you're, you're saying there's spiritual harm, but that's very vague. But you also said that spiritual harm is also tied to uh, other kinds of harm. So just tell, don't tell me there's a spiritual harm. That doesn't help. Tell me what harm there is that I would be able to see and recognize in a situation where people have sex before marriage. So the, pro the problem with your question is you're expecting me to give this one example and it's a one size fits all that, okay, well, every time we have uh, an instance of premarital sex, this effect is going to happen. That's not the way sin or spiritual harms operate. 
there are it affects different people differently. So okay, I then tell me example. tell me then how how it happens in a way that that someone uh, who's not attuned to spiritual things can tell that it's happening. You know, because if if um, if you say that uh, that uh, you know it could cause depression in a person, well, we can see depression. So that would that would be something that uh, I can I can look at and we can look at statistically to see if people who have premarital sex are more prone to depression than uh, people who don't. So I, I, I need to see what you mean by the harm in a way that I can understand. Yeah, well, it's it's it, depression would be another example. Um, obsession is an example and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that example kind of thing, but the problem with this is I'm just providing anecdotal evidence and I don't know if it's statistical. I'm not going to say, oh, in the majority of cases, it always leads to depression or something like that. Um, not even in my own experience with people that I know and stuff like that. Well, can you give me some anecdotes then? Yeah. Uh, like I said, I brought up the example of Jonathan Doherty. Um, it, for him, it led to depression. He he also uh, his soul was so warped that his sense of worth was tied to you know his his sex and stuff like that. And you see okay, that. Okay, but what what led to that exactly? I, I I know I don't know Jonathan Doherty, but I know his story all too well um, because it's it's played out um, a lot of times, especially. Um, well, let's let's just say I've had uh, reason to hear his story uh, any number of times, but you're saying that that his downfall happened because he had premarital sex. Well, for for him specifically, it started with porn, and then it it built into premarital sex during his college years and stuff like that. And okay, it so the way he saw so it. let me. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not bringing porn into it yet. Uh, before the series is over, I do want to talk about porn, but in, in the case of premarital sex, you're still not, you're not giving me anything to hang my hat on. Well, um, it, he, he's, he, it changed the way he saw people. He stopped seeing them as image bearers of God and he saw them, started seeing them more as objects for his gratification. Right. So there, there are lots of reasons that that can happen, but it, it sounds like in his case, premarital sex wasn't the case. So I'm still waiting on an anecdote just for that. Premarital sex causes spiritual harm. Give me an example of that. What so that I can see what kind of harm you're talking about. I just gave it to you. That no, you gave correct. me an example of someone who uh, got into porn at an early age and became uh, obsessed with the idea of sex and objectization uh, even before they had sex. So that is not an example of premarital sex taking a person who was fairly well adjusted and well balanced in creating a harm. He did That's, say that sometimes depression results. So he, he agreed with depression. No, well, okay, depression. but I, I need to I need to hear this in a in a fairly direct, clear straight. I'm not trying to bully, I'm not trying to badger. If you don't have any examples, I'm okay with that. But but the specific Thing has been out there for a while, uh, premarital sex in, in particular. Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked about, uh, both Andrew and I have talked about a good that can come from premarital sex. Yes. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting for you to tell me about a harm that can come from it. The good that can come from it is not ending up in a marriage that has, that is fraught with bad sex for the next 50 years. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. Um, so, so yeah, again, the, the problem, your question is problematic because I, I did give you an answer uh, and it was the proper answer to your question. But the reason you don't like it is because it's not a one size fits all thing, right? Like he, but no, the, 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 the Doherty situation wasn't about premarital sex. It, it may have, it, premarital sex was down the road from that. But the premarital sex didn't cause his porn addiction. You said so no, yourself. No, no. no, but the, the premarital sex 
part for him directly led to his changing the way he saw people. Whereas the no, pornography like, changed the way he saw people. The premarital sex was something that happened as a result of the pornography. I'm trying to figure out what you think is a result of premarital sex. So you can't you can't use an example where someone had a problem before they had sex and say the sex was the problem. Well, there there are people that didn't have that problem but went through the same thing. So I can just use an example of them. The exact same thing. They engaged, started engaging in premarital well, sex, and that, that altered the way they saw the value of people. Um, well, that's that's what I'm asking for. I'm asking for at the very least an anecdote. It wouldn't be evidence, but at least it would be something so that I could understand what you're talking about. Okay. So because you're 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 seeing a general a general rule where premarital sex leads to some kind of harm. And I am suggesting I have never seen a general rule where premarital sex leads to any kind of harm. Uh, and so I'm I'm just trying to figure out if I can understand um, what harm you're seeing. Hold on, Andrew. If I can understand what harm you are seeing as a general rule from premarital sex, that gives me something that I can at least look up. I can begin to study. I can contemplate it. And if I if I see that harm, because I could be convinced of it, then then I could agree with you on that. But you, you're not giving me anything to work with. Well, I just gave you one when I modified it, right? When I gave that, I can give you anecdotes of people like that um, who become obsessed and start altering the way they see as a direct result of the premarital sex. They had nothing to do with the sins or pornography or anything like that beforehand. And the same thing and, and you and would you would be able to you would be willing to state academically that their view of uh women and relationships was a direct result of them having sex before marriage yeah because they they give testimonial evidence that that's what did it now here i wouldn't submit it academically as a reason that yeah this cause will always lead to this effect because I think that there's, it affects people differently. Like I, I know people that engage in that and it didn't result in that, right? So that that's the problem with- well, Why should there ever be an exception? So it's because um, the way that sins operate, it's individualized, it's relative to individuals, right? Sins affect people differently depending on the degree that you are infected with the sin disease and stuff like that right so some people are stronger than others are <laughs> okay dave i've got to ask a question man it's it's driving me crazy um so first of all i, I think when we talked about depression we can solve depression that's a that's a physical thing we hand them an ssri but but the spiritual harm that i would be interested in is a case where someone has no religious context, right? And they don't have any. They don't have any sense of premarital sex is something that should cause me guilt because God is sitting in the back of my head, watching me bump uglies with my next door neighbor. Right. So, so um, I agree that feelings of guilt can hurt people, but I don't agree that feelings of guilt about premarital sex are actually spiritual feelings. And, they're, and, and the reason I don't is that those, those senses of wrong, that sense of guilt that you're talking about, doesn't seem to occur in people outside of a spiritual context. And so it seems to me that there's this sort of special pleading going on when you say, well, there's this wide range of things that can happen to people. Um, you know, so you, know, you have this premarital sex and you might get depressed, you might feel guilty, uh, you know, you, you might stop eating eggs and start eating waffles, you know, <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the wide range is. But to track spiritual harm is the thing that I think we're all still about. How We're, we're still trying to zero in, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm still trying to zero in on a way to tell that it's a spiritual harm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pick up there. I, I know that there's only a limited amount of time for this particular uh, interview, and there's a, there's a 
track that I want to that I want to go down because I want to make sure that things get covered. But yes, that's that's okay, a and part I'll be of quiet. It. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's there's there's a there's a part of this that um, is yeah you you're going to need to be able to clinically um, fairly certainly uh, track cause to effect. And I don't I don't think that anything that you're saying tracks cause to effect in the way that um, would be necessary for me to agree that X caused Y harm. So um, even even if you have a person who says I had um, I had premarital sex um, and then I started looking at uh, women in a uh, in a way that was unhealthy, I don't even know that that means that premarital sex caused them to start looking at uh, women in a way that's unhealthy. Um, so I, you're going to need some, you're going to need to connect the dots a little bit better. It's a little bit like saying, you know, I, I uh, broke my leg and I took this medicine for pain and now I'm a drug addict. And so therefore opioids are sin uh, because they cause spiritual harm. Uh, no, they're not. You just, you just might have an addictive personality and you, sh you should live with the pain and not the opioids. Um, but that's, that doesn't mean the opioids are bad or that alcohol uh, is a sin because, you know, I drank it and I got drunk. Uh, so alcohol, therefore, uh, causes spiritual harm. No, it doesn't. Uh, you just might be uh, the kind of person who can't have alcohol, uh, but you, you can't paste it on the entire lot of humanity that alcohol is somehow bad and therefore no one should do it. And so even if you could connect uh, to pornography or to premarital sex or to something else that, you know, this person had bad relationships uh, sp springing from that, that this is a general rule that this is a bad thing for humanity. And that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm hearing from you. And so even if you could give me some more clear anecdotal evidences, that's, that's not a, a statistical sample that I can work with, and it doesn't point me to there is a problem with humanity. Now, something that would point me to it is if you say, you know, I, you know, you put, this person put a gun to their head and pulled the trigger, and now they're dead. Therefore, people shouldn't do that. I would agree. I think that we've got a pretty large statistical sample that says that creates uh, some physical and spiritual harm. <laughs> but you don't have that for for premarital sex. And so I don't I don't understand why you would jump to the conclusion that there is spiritual harm just on the basis of the fact that some, not all, and I, I think not even most people are affected by the in, in the worst possible way that that you're bringing up. Do you do you see the thing that I'm trying to say and why I don't understand your example? Um, well, yeah, you you know I do because we had a private chat so that's why you're asking me this question isn't really that, that fair well, right but I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you a chance to reframe it in a in a way that um you know for for the listeners to hear because I want to be fair to you and I also don't want to hold you to anything that you know you may have said at another time um because I don't want to be held to anything I said at another time I may have changed my mind uh since then so mm -hmm. I, I want to be fair to your position and and just say I if if in fact there was some type of external harm uh, that I could see that you could convince me of, and, and, and I think this is true for most skeptics, we would agree with you uh, that that thing uh, should probably be considered, if not bad or wrong, at least dangerous uh, and, and should be taken with way more consideration. But I have simply never heard a Christian make a coherent argument about what the harm is. And so it's, you know, without that, it's really hard for us to get on board. And, and I wouldn't mind getting on board. Um, yeah, well, um, like, I, like I said, with the anecdotal evidence for my position, um, I think I, you would at least agree that there are some cases where it does cause harm. I don't know. I don't know that I would. If we were talking about pornography, maybe, and and I would say hesitant, maybe there. But if we're just talking about premarital sex, 
I don't think I can. I, uh, I'm being perfectly honest when I say I don't know of an example where that has caused harm. Uh, because sex, there's nothing magical that happens to sex when you're married. Uh, so wedding night, you have sex. Um, it's the same sex that you could have before your wedding night. The, the, your body doesn't know that, uh, you know, some justice of the peace said, I do. Your, your body is just having sex. And so I don't know what the difference would be if a couple, uh, you know, they gave into temptation and they had sex the night before marriage, as opposed to they waited until after their marriage. I, I don't know of a single example where that caused one iota of harm, nor can I imagine what harm it would cause. So, so yeah, you can't imagine because we, I just gave you a real world scenario of somebody where it did directly cause harm. So what well, well, no, is in the example that I just gave, I've, 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 I've cleared out all the variables. These are people that are getting married. Uh, these, they just, they simply had sex, the, you know, a few hours before marriage as opposed to a few hours after marriage. Yeah, well, so I'm not responding to that specific thing, but okay, I was well, wrong. But for yeah. your case, for your case to make sense though, you would have to point out why that would be mm -hmm. wrong and what harm that would cause. And I believe that you think that it would cause harm, but I don't, I can't imagine what harm it would cause other than something that would be strictly spiritual that you, you just can't describe otherwise. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm willing to accept that and move on. But if you're saying that there is, there is some kind of harm. It would affect your relationship with God, which is your spirit faculty of your soul, because you're no okay. longer obeying him. Uh, so that's okay. another direct result and that sort of thing. Let uh, me ask both of you a question is a feeling of guilt. So David, I like what you've set up there. So you've, you've, got, uh, you've got two kids who did it the night before and not the night after, right? So uh, maybe, maybe they did it the morning before the afternoon, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so they did it really close in time. But one is an authorized act and the other is not an authorized act because one is inside marriage and the other is not. So is a feeling of, is a persistent feeling of guilt that they actually didn't wait when they were supposed to or do either of you accept that as a harm that 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 would be enough to call uh, doing it beforehand doing it before marriage rather than after would that be uh, enough I, to I register as harm think, i think a guilt feeling is harm but i think that the real harm would be well what's what's the uh, cause of that guilt feeling. That was so, where I was going to get to. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. but in in my scenario, I've I'm I'm I've eliminated all that. It's just it's because I'm trying to get at the real objection here, it so that I can get to a real understanding. So I don't I don't I don't need any any guilt or any uh, oh we got pregnant three three seconds before we got married. I don't need any of that. No pregnancy happened. They simply had sex a few hours before the preacher said I do versus a few hours after. And there is no guilt here. And, and what Dale is saying is that would still create a harm. And all I'm saying is I don't know what that harm would be. And what Dale has said is satisfactory to me, what he said at the end, uh, which is, well, the harm would be that they disobeyed God. Because at that point, we're talking about strictly a spiritual harm that cannot be seen in any other way. And if that's once, you know, because that leaves the Thomistic realm uh, that he was talking about before, and that just suggests that there is a kind of spiritual harm that doesn't show up in any um, physical or emotional way. So that's, that's fine if that's what you're talking about. Um, obviously, I can't, I can't get on board with that kind of harm. But if there is some other harm going on, I would get on board with it. Uh, with what you're saying well don't forget though this this is still within the thomistic realm right like your your spirit is a faculty of your soul uh kind of thing in your relation it, that allows you to have a relationship with god and sins are problem in virtue ethics sins help to form character traits over time um as they become ingrained in that sort of thing so you know obviously 
not in every case, if it's just like a one-off sin like that, it, oh, I'm not going to be able to prove that, oh, this will always happen. But it's one step in the thing. How, how do we become brave, as Plato said? Well, by doing brave things. And over and over again, it certain, over time, it becomes a habit. Then it becomes ingrained as a part of your character and that sort of thing. And I, I believe that this happens. So that's what I'm talking about when it's soul warping. Um, I, I, I stole, I sinned. Uh, I stole a drink when I was a kid from Burger King or something. That one act, if, if you're going to come, oh, well, prove to me that stealing has warped your soul or caused you to become a delinquent or something like that. Well, it, it didn't for me. I'm sure I could point to examples of people that it did. That was a first step. And it, over time, changed their attitude towards stealing. I mean, there are people today that I just heard on the news, a pol some politician on the left was, was saying that looting was owed to them. It, that's reparation or some nonsense like that. So they've, they've been warped kind of thing and that could go back to this one step. But again, it's, it's not a one size fits all. I stole when I was a kid pop or like one sink candies. And guess what? I didn't um, continue on that road. So there is this notion of building up and it affects people differently and stuff like that. But it's okay. So look, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let you have the uh, last word on it. I get where you're going. Um, sure. There's some follow up, but I think that um, there's been enough conversation to understand where you're coming from and where the pushback is. Let me just, let me just explore the other side of that real briefly, which is the spiritual good. So you made a very bold statement, um, something to the effect that, um, uh, marriages uh christian marriages are better in in some uh in some way they're they're different they have a component uh that other marriages don't have uh so i i think the same type of questioning that uh i had for harm would would go for here is there any way is there any external way that someone who is not a christian and, and who is not in that marriage can see this spiritual benefit that you're talking about does it manifest in any way that would show up to someone else uh like immediately and stuff like that well uh, or over time measuring statistically um um you know is there is there any anything that would show up like for instance uh christian marriages last longer uh, that would that would be a great thing to hear you uh, defend uh, or say, you know, I, because having studied this a while, I can tell you Christian marriages don't last longer. Um, or there's 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 less or no adultery in Christian marriages. No, there's just as much adultery in Christian marriages. In fact, some uh, studies show that there's more. Um, so we we would eliminate those as the spiritual benefits that you're talking about. So are there any spiritual benefits that you can mention that would be visible uh, in some way? Well, the so I, I would argue those those two benefits are for true Christians. And that's where the, the controversy is going to be, right? Because you're looking at stats of just professing Christians, meaning there's lots of fakes, don't care. Um, it comes down to what's a true what it's the statistics among true Christians, then obviously how are you going to tell who's a true Christian versus not and stuff like that? They, they can't do that. They're just like taking statistics. Um, but yeah, I, I would say those are benefits. I, I, I don't know of any true Christian who's been divorced. I don't know of any true Christian um, who's committed adultery or something like that. So Okay. But there, there's no more, there are no more true Christians whose life, uh, whose marriages last forever and don't have adultery than atheists. This is, this is my, I mean, so you can say this is a benefit of true Christians, but these are not exclusive features of Christians. So I, I would say that that kind of marriage is a, a little bit more rare overall, but when you, when you poll atheists and Christians, you, it, Christians don't stand out. There's no differentiation uh, there. So sure, uh, let's say all true Christians have this benefit, but the same percentage of atheists have the same benefit. So 
Um, I don't I don't see how we would point that out as a spiritual benefit when non spiritual people can duplicate it. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. That's totally true. Um, and like I said, don't forget, even non Christians get these benefits from from having sex within marriage and stuff like that, um, or just even having sex even outside of marriage. There's benefits to that, right? Um, so, you know, they they can even though it's in a corrupted form and it's not to the same degree that I think um, a true Christian experiences when they have sex within a proper marriage context and God is actively involved in that bonding process where they bond to a greater degree than I think uh, other couples can. Um, you know, non non true Christians. Um, can do either in or outside the marriage. And, okay. and I guess what you want, you'd want me to say this for the audience. Well, obviously, the, the evidence that I've been giving is just anecdotal evidence or testimonial evidence. And I, I think that that can prove that it's plausible that there is this, what I'm calling spiritual harm and spiritual benefits, or you can just call them harm or benefits um, to these acts. Uh, but I can't prove like what you're saying that, oh yeah, in every case, this will automatically uh, do it or lead to this or something like that. In fact, the evidence proves anecdotally, it doesn't always lead to, to that kind of thing in every single case immediately. So my main reason for believing that this spiritual harm and spiritual benefit theory is true or and believing that true Christian marriages, unions are superior to others is divine revelation. That is my reason for believing this. If I were to conclude that Christianity is false or that the Bible is not inspired um, by God, I would reverse my opinion because the secular evidence, I don't think, based on what I know of it, which is not that, <coughs> you know, not as good as someone like Mac Attack or Marvin, they're, they're really into these kinds of debates, um, it would be insufficient for me to conclude either way. Um, so I wouldn't make these claims apart from divine revelation. So you probably wanted me to say that. So people are clear, why am I making these claims? Fundamentally, divine revelation tells me that there's a difference. You know, Jews were allowed to get divorced at one point, then all of a sudden, no, don't get divorced. Something must have changed. Something's fundamentally different and that justifies that command um, and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. Okay, um, look, Dale, uh, this has been a this has been a great interview uh, to clarify that, and I appreciate that. I I was prepared to I was prepared to let it go right there, but you brought up the whole divorce thing. Um, so allow me to just say one tiny thing about that, or at least ask a question, um, which is. If divorce fundamentally causes spiritual harm, I cannot imagine the scenario where God says, well, I'll just let them do it because they're they're just a bunch of monkeys. Um, it doesn't matter, but I'll, I'll crack down later. But right now, eh, no big deal. I don't, if, if there was something fundamentally bad about divorce, then it seems like uh, you're giving God a pass for uh, allowing the institution of something fundamentally bad. It, well, it's because uh, the degree of spiritual harm. So divorce is always bad. It causes spiritual harm. It's not God's design for human beings, any human beings. Uh, but because there's that benefit, you know, only true Christians, they bond to a degree that nobody else does ripping that apart why why is causes much more spiritual harm and this is why it's okay to divorce even for true christians if someone commits adultery or something like that 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 damages the the bond that god has created between those two people but in the old testament times or even today for unbelievers yes there's bonding as god created sex for that but it's it's not it's not a perfect fit like it is for true christians and because of that, when they separate, it doesn't cause the same degree of damage. So it's at a degree where God can allow it. But at, just to be clear, and I, I think you were clear, but I just want to make sure, uh, give, you, give you the last, last word on this. 
if it wasn't for biblical revelation, you would be on my side of the fence. You wouldn't see the harm. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen any like secular evidence that is con that's conclusive or like I would feel comfortable saying I lean one direction or the other. I, I would right. probably lean in the direction of skeptics and say, you know, premarital sex, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with it. Homosexuality, same thing. I don't see, I have no moral qualms with it of my own accord, apart from divine inspiration. And just to be, just to be clear for the audience, I don't, uh, I'm not saying the things I'm saying because of an atheist uh, and because I hate religion. Now, I do hate religion. I am an atheist, but that's, that's not where these beliefs come from. When I was a Christian, I thought like you did. And uh, it took a lot of study for me to get where I am. So I didn't just change my opinions just because I stopped being a Christian. I didn't start thinking, oh, divorce, what a great thing. Um, what I was concerned about is what you were concerned about, which is harm. And I wanted to know what the harm was. And I wanted to believe the things that would eliminate uh, harm or um you know that were causing harm and as i studied it and as i grew i just couldn't find it i couldn't i couldn't find a good reason to hang on to those um taboos that i that i had um it it, it just it doesn't it just wasn't there and so that's that's why I am uh, where I am. But if I were if I were still a Christian, I would actually argue exactly the same way that you're arguing and say that it, you know it's divine revelation, and you either believe it or you don't. Yeah, uh, it's it's just it's the case that you know you can't always have proof for every single claim as a Christian that you believe. Some some of it does just come down to the fact that well, you believe Christianity is true and that. The Bible is the word of God, so I, I follow those commands. Um, but again, my knowledge in this area, this isn't an area that I'm not obsessed with, you know, sexual ethics. I, I'm more interested in philosophy of religion or arguments for God's existence. But there are others like Mac Attack or Marvin and stuff, and they're, or, or even Nick Zach, and they're way more knowledgeable about it. Sure, but I write about some of this stuff professionally uh, myself, so I don't, I'm not giving up much. No, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> so, saying for, for the Christians watching, don't don't feel disheartened. Like, oh, well, Dale doesn't think the secular evidence is good enough to uh, speak apart from divine revelation. That that is just a reflection of my ignorance because I don't look hardcore into the evidence of this field. But of what I've seen, uh, I don't see anything wrong. With I don't think anyone uh, on that side thinks that you let the side down. Uh, in fact, I think that any Christian in the listening audience right now should be very thankful uh, that you agree to uh, have this conversation uh, to uh, give your side of the story. And I hope that any Christian listening to this will agree that um, I, uh, you know, while, while providing pushback, I gave you a chance to explicate your uh, theory correctly. Is there any other thing that you would like to say on it as a last word? Um, I think we covered uh, just naming designs. Um, yeah, I think I think in terms of you know sex within marriage versus not, um, I think we've kind of covered everything that I can see in my notes. So. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I. Um... There, there are one or two little things that I that I have that I could ask, but I think at, at the end of the day, it all I, I think it's been covered by the answers given. So we'll we'll see what stirs up in the comments around Tuesday when I drop this. So uh, until then, I, I just want to say thanks for agreeing to do that, because this is a very important conversation. And it's um, without that perspective, I think the conversation is less and I, uh, less useful, uh, quite frankly. So even though I think I'm right and you're wrong, uh, I think that the, it wouldn't have been much good for me to simply give my position without an opposing position. So um, yeah. I, uh, once again, I appreciate that. And I wish more Christians would uh, take your example and accept the offer to 
come on the show and tell people what you think. This is not an atheist audience. I have reason to believe that the uh, atheist listeners and the Christian listeners are, you know, fairly close. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't show up in the comments, but it shows up in other ways. And so, um, Christians Christians don't really need to be afraid to speak. There are lots of people listening that would wish to hear from more Christians uh, who would step up and defend what they believe. And so I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I would just kind of echo, like I know some people are, are scared, to, you know, it's kind of like a taboo subject and stuff like that, but it's, I just say, remember it's not. I mean, God is mind sex, it's a good thing. You know, I mean, read the Song of Solomon. That's a celebration of, uh, of the sexual union and stuff like that. So it's, you know, as, as long as it's handled respectfully and, and seriously and that sort of thing not just a, a big joke um yeah there's no reason to be afraid to get in there and find out what does god really want in this very important aspect of human beings lives yeah you want to go ahead and uh, give your um url while you're at it uh because people listening for the first time may not realize you have a show you have your own channel um you've got you've got your own blog your own uh comments uh tell people about it all right. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm the host of Real Seekers or Real Seeker Ministries, and the website I just looked it up. So it's realseekerministries.wordpress.com, um, or just search on Anchor or on YouTube, Real Seekers, and and I'll pop up, kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, Andrew, by the way, if uh, you liked the cut of his jib, you can uh, find his stuff at reasonpress.net. That's reasonpress.net, uh, spelled just the way it sounds. Uh, jump in there. He's got um, Still Unbelievable, uh, where he talks about some of this type of stuff. He, and he usually has, uh, he and Matthew uh, usually have guests. Uh, you'll also find Proscenium, where he talks about stuff that's not like this stuff. Uh, and so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of nice, too. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, I think with that uh, next week we I, I well next week in a few days I do expect to have a, a few more Christian guests to talk about this and hopefully by then they will have heard this show to hear what you have to say and uh, those who are wanting to make their own voice heard skepticsandseekers.squarespace.com email me skepticsandseekers at gmail.com goodbye everybody bye. -bye.